Splatoon, more than a game, is a team esport. And understanding the roles and positions within the game, such as anchor, backliner, support, midliner, slayer, and skirmisher, is a must-have knowledge for those who want to not only get good at the game, but also want to be able to actually understand it. Knowing what your role is in your team should work as a manual, and every time when you're not sure of what exactly you should be doing or what decisions you should be making, you should be able to just refer back to it to find out what to do. Being aware of what your role is also works as a checklist, which you can use to properly judge whether you're actually doing well on a match or not. Keeping in mind that the number of kills and assists you had doesn't say much about your overall performance, and it doesn't always mean you did well. And even though every member on a team has the same objective on a match, having weapons that play differently because of their different characteristics also means that each of these weapons will play that main objective differently, with different responsibilities all to their team. And even if, at ranked, a huge amount of players doesn't seem to know what they're doing, if you're put on a team that finally knows how to properly play the game, then the focus changes, because then they want to know if you know how to play the game too. So, let's find out, because this is my guide on Splatoon roles and positions. And today, we are going to talk about the support role. Welcome everyone, this is Samba speaking and today I'm here to tell you everything that you should know about support weapons. The fundamentals. This video should be the first episode of a series where I'll be explaining to you guys everything you should know about the different roles and positions we've got as Splatoon, in order to help out any player who might be looking for ways to step up their game and maybe don't know how. So, without further ado, let's get to the video. Support weapons. I'm sure you've heard about them before, you might even have a general idea of what they are, but still, what is a support weapon? First off, let me start by saying, I don't personally believe that every weapon is necessarily tied up to a role, but it is undeniable that most weapons in this game were designed to work in a specific way with different strengths and different weaknesses. Some weapons can paint better than others, some are better at killing, some can move faster, some have more range. Still, the most important lesson I expect you to take away from this video is that playing support has way more to do with the way you're playing than just choosing a certain weapon even if it is a support weapon. Quotation marks there. Having said that, Splatoon is a game where if you have the floor covered in your own ink color, you and your team pretty much have an advantage over the enemy team. Map control provides your team with mobility, as you can swim and move faster on your own ink, hiding spots, as you can submerge yourself and be invisible in your ink, and most importantly, when you've got the floor covered in your ink color, your enemy can swim, can hide, and can even stand on it without taking damage, which means that by having map control, you're pretty much containing your enemies to a limited amount of space and reducing the number of spots with which you have to worry about or dedicate any amount of attention to. And that's incredibly valuable on a game where there's a lot going on at all times. So, it should come as no surprise to realize that one of the biggest ways to play support at Splatoon is by simply painting the map as much as you can and helping your teammates by providing them with map control. Saying that support players should be working towards having map control doesn't mean, however, that only support players should be the ones inking the ground. Every player on a team should be worried with putting down as much ink as they can. However, as I mentioned earlier, each weapon has its own different responsibilities on a team. And if a weapon that, say, was supposed to be getting kills to clear the way for the rest of the team is actually wasting time inking the map, then that weapon won't be able to do its job properly, as it will be compensating for another player who actually had a weapon whose main responsibility was to be surfing. Reason why? If you're trying to support your teammates in order to allow them to focus and excel at their job the best they can, the first thing you should have in mind is that they'll need turf to work with. 
since it is the most basic element of Splatoon, indispensable for anything they try to do. However, when you start inking, you're going to have to use the best of your judgment to figure out what's actually relevant turf at that moment. For example, if you're playing Splat Zones and your team's number one priority, the zone, is already under your control, you start thinking about what comes next. Is there anyone on the enemy team still alive? Are they pushing back already? If the answer to both of these questions is no, you might want to think about that fight that will ensue on the near future, and you might want to make sure your team will have enough ink to work with when trying to defend the zone when the enemy team finally pushes back. For that, you might want to ink the entirety of the territory where that future fight might be happening at, such as the immediate vicinity of the zone, while being careful not to get too pushed up, since you don't want to get killed in the process. By doing so, you'll be providing your team with the most advantageous position they can be at to try and win the fights that will come. Because anything that happens will always include the need of having to swim around in as much ink as they can get. What you don't want to be doing though, is to be way back at your spawn inking ground that is pretty much irrelevant, because at that moment the fight won't even get there unless your team is actually the one trapped in spawn, in which case your spawn area becomes the most relevant area you can turf for that moment. But to be turfing your spawn at a moment when your team is pushed up because you're in control of the objective only means that your team will have to fight pretty much a 3v4 when the enemy team finally counter pushes, as you won't be present for the fight and you won't be containing anyone with your ink either. So, you should always think of turf, but most importantly, you should always think of what's relevant turf. If you decide to play support, it's important that you realize in which ways your presence or absence impact on the battlefield, since, as it is the case with your turf input, your absence can be felt by your team and by the enemy team as well. Because of that, making sure you don't die unnecessarily is also a huge part of playing support. Even if you don't think that respawn times are that long, at Splatoon, tides can turn very quickly, especially at some game modes. And you dying might be just what will start the chain reaction that might allow for the enemy team to have the perfect opportunity to start a push. Something that any weapon can be guilty of, but the support doesn't even have a reason that justifies dying while being too aggressive. For that reason, support players really aren't supposed to play too aggressively and are expected to have a way more conservative positioning most of the time. If you find yourself dying too frequently or chasing down your enemy too much, that might be a sign that you should either turn down a notch or simply start playing a Slayer weapon that actually fits that playstyle and with which you might have a higher success rate. That, however, doesn't mean you shouldn't try and go for kills as well, as you're not and you shouldn't be just a painting machine. I'm sure most of us here has already met on solo queue with either a junior or a zap who had a slayer complex and pretty much proceeded to slay your whole team, maybe even outperforming their own slayer in the process. That's cool. What's not cool is when the map is covered in enemy ink and your support player is either sharking somewhere or going full aggro at the enemy's spawn, just to get killed immediately instead of being doing his actual job. So, again, you've got higher priorities, but if you can get a couple of kills in the process, that's solid. So, how can you get kills without risking yourself too much? One way is by simply not engage yourself in fights where you don't have a high probability of winning. That is, killing enemies who have been shot multiple times and are already one shot to death, that's not a problem. Or hitting a couple of shots on a player and then getting away from him as soon as he turns in your direction in a way that can get you killed, so your slayer can maybe come later on and consolidate the kill for you, that's really good. But 
spamming bombs at your enemy from a safe distance and either getting them killed, hurt or as far away from the objective as possible, that's perfect. There's nothing wrong with running away from fights you think you're going to lose. If you surviving means that your team will have the advantage of having you still in battle, still turfing, maybe even with a special to help in the following battle. Which is always better than having a player coming back from spawn with nothing to show for. You might feel better by fighting until the end and dying, but a lot of times backing up is the smartest move. On top of that, being a support player, you're not the one who should be consolidating kills. Even if high kill numbers might make you look good, they're not the parameter that tell whether you've played well or not. And in actuality, having a high number of assists might indicate way more that you've done your job properly. First, because kills that happen during your armor give you an assist, which indicate you've kept your teammates safe while they were doing their job. Second, even if your slayer was perfectly capable of winning every single fight by himself, a 2v1 is always an easier fight, and sometimes your chip damage will be what's going to guarantee his safety and allow both of you to continue either defending or pushing. So, when it comes to getting kills, your judgment is your most valuable tool to be a good support player as you're the one who should evaluate whether you being aggressive might be what your team needs at that moment or whether you staying alive, turfing or preserving your special might be what will help them the most to win the game. Another very important responsibility of a support player is playing objective. It's true that in solo queue most teams are usually too disorganized for that and frequently players will try and solo the objective by throwing themselves at it, regardless of their role on the team or if they're going to get instantly killed by doing so and accomplish nothing. But when you've got a well-organized team, a team who knows what they're doing, which is what we see in competitive, it's the support player who's expected to be carrying the Rainmaker, getting on the tower, painting the zone and collecting as much clams as he can. Again, Everyone on a team should be playing objective, but each weapon plays it in a different way with different responsibilities. I won't go into much detail into it right now because I'll be approaching this topic into each role's respective video, but as Slayer, for example, most of the time is pretty much supposed to clear the way and create openings for his team in order to prevent enemies from getting closer to the objective and he does that by either killing them or distracting his enemies. Backliners are a second in the chain of command when it comes to who should be playing objective, but it's always better to have players with that kind of range free to contain enemies and deal with players standing at inconvenient distant positions who are too far away from your slayer's reach but who could still be a problem. As for the support, after they've already inked as much relevant turf as possible, after they've already assisted their team getting kills, then they can go for the objective. So always keep in mind. It's useless to grab the Rainmaker or get on the tower or whatever just to get killed immediately after you do it. You might have capped the zone, but if you're dead and your team is mostly dead or away from the zone, then the enemy team can pretty much instantly recap it and establish a way more solid control. And you've died for nothing. For that reason, knowing how to properly read the game and understand what are the appropriate moments to push the objective is one of the most important skills of a support player, together with knowing the most effective ways to push the objective, such as knowing the best paths to run the Rainmaker, for example. Understand, however, that none of this is set on stone. Everything on Splatoon depends on what you've got at that moment, on that match, on that team comp. Perhaps you'll be put on a team without Slayers, or on a team with double backline. Maybe you'll just have died at that moment when your team sees an opening to push, so they decide to start without you. Adapt yourself to your current situation. Get on board with your team and go back to your list of responsibilities to figure out how each of your duties fit into that new situation. 
just don't be the player who pretty much works against his scene just because every single thing isn't how it's supposed to be. Being a good player in general will require you to be able to recognize what are your team's needs at each moment and then try to fulfill that hole as much as you can. Still on that same note of knowing how to read the game, understanding what are the most appropriate moments to use your special, especially if it's armor, it's definitely a requirement to be a good support player. Because even though most specials might see individual on their effect, all of them can and should be used, taking into account your whole team's needs. Even when a Slayer uses a splashdown, either to survive or to consolidate a kill, for example, even though it might seem like an individual move, he's actually fulfilling one of his responsibilities to his team, which is to either get kills or to survive to be able to keep pushing players away and killing them in the process. But no other special in the game screens more team play than armor does, as it is the only special in the game that actually affects your whole team when you use it. And it is the only special completely focused on protecting players instead of killing others. So, it is not a coincidence that most weapons that support players choose have armor for a special. A well-timed armor can be the difference in between a strong and successful push where you get a good amount of points and most of your players come out of it alive, or a weak push where most of your players end up getting killed and your push is stopped in its tracks because the enemy team simply threw a bunch of specials and sadly that armor that could have helped just wasn't there. So, being aware and being prepared for those moments when your armor will be needed is what is going to step up your game as a support player. And for that, keeping track of your special meter should become a habit, so you always know whether you'll be able to get that armor in time for that push or counter push. Also, you should always know how many players are still alive on your team and if they're still in game or coming back from spawn, so you don't waste your armor only on yourself or at a moment when no one will use it. You should always keep track of how many players are still alive on the enemy team as well, as that can be an indicator that maybe it's a good time to start a push and you'll probably need that armor for that. With enough experience, you'll be able to identify the moments when your team is about to initiate a push or maybe the enemy team is about to counter push. With the right timing, you can activate your armor just at the moment when your team will need it the most in order to better resist them and come out with the majority of players alive. On the other hand, not having armor charged when your team needs it can also be a bad play for a support player as those players who know what they are doing might be expecting you to armor and they might be just waiting for you to use your special in order to make a move. So, you've gotta know that your special is one of the few on the game that your whole team may be counting with, and for that reason, you're the only player who's not only allowed, but you have the incentive to go around inking even random places of the map, when there aren't more relevant places to ink, of course. You just gotta have good judgment once again, because having armor is great, but having the whole team present to either push or defend is even better, so your good judgment is expected here as well. And of course, not only of armor lives a support player, and there are many other specials that can be helpful to your team if you apply the same logic discussed up to this point. For one, bubbles are great to be aggressive, but they can also be used as a shield to protect players when making a push, or else to paint a large area of the map such as to instantly cap the zone. So, if you're actively thinking of how your specials fit within your responsibilities and how they impact on your team, you can always find a way to properly use them in order to extend your support further than your weapon capabilities. So, there it is, guys. I think that covers the fundamentals of what it means to play as a support player. Of course, that in solo queue, things aren't always that nice and clean, especially at lower ranks, but what I believe is that you should always try and do your best, and try and play your role correctly, even when your team isn't doing the same. 
So this way, when you get on a team together with people who actually know what they're doing, instead of being used to a lot of bad habits, you'll be already doing everything that is expected from you. Again, none of this is set on stone and you might have your own play style that differs from this and that works for you already. These are just some of the behaviors that can be observed and can be expected from successful support players in general. So this information is just something you should make sure you take into account into your gameplay, but after you know it, then you can go ahead and make it your own. If you were unsure on how you should be playing support, now that you know these concepts, you should be able to already start doing solid work and I'm sure that if you implement these concepts into your gameplay, that will be something that your teammates will notice and they'll realize that they can count on you. I really hope this video has helped you guys understand the support role a bit better and that you'll find the results you were looking for when you've started watching this video. As a last step, unrelated to the gameplay itself, but aim at your well-being so you can have the best mindset to enjoy yourself while playing, it's important to keep in mind that support players don't usually win matches by themselves, as most of their time is invested in trying to help others succeed and to excel doing their part. So, if your teammates are not doing their job properly, it's not something you should expect to see a support player carry his team by himself. But if you keep being critical and if you can be satisfied with your own performance, with your own growth, no matter if you win or lose, playing support really is a fun and rewarding role. Even though they not always are the center of attention, we're all thankful for our support players, a role that actually requires a lot of skill and brain power. And always remember, Splatoon isn't about who gets the most kills by the end of the match. It is about who play objective the best. If you believe this guide has helped you in any way, and if you think it might help someone else as well, please make sure to share it with other people so they too can learn. Even if they don't play support, I'm sure understanding what everyone else is and should be doing is going to help you improve your own game. Last but not least, here goes a list of the weapons I believe that fit the best into the role of support, together with those who might be slightly under a different category, but that might still work well playing as a support, just in case you're not sure which weapon to choose. Soon, I'll be dropping another guide video having a look at the Slayer role this time, among other content I intend to drop, so if you've liked this one and you're interested in this type of content, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. Again, this is Samba speaking to you and I hope you have a nice day.